Putin and Netanyahu show why bad things happen to bad leaders. It is shocking to me how much Vladimir Putin and Benjamin Netanyahu have in common these days, both see themselves as great strategic chess players in a world where, they think, everyone else knows only how to play checkers. And yet both completely misread the world in which they were operating. In fact, they misread it so badly that it looks as if each is not playing chess or checkers but rather Russian roulette, all by themselves. Russian roulette is not meant to be played alone, but alone they both are. Putin thought that he could capture Kiev in a few days and thus, at a very low cost, use Russian expansion into Ukraine to forever blunt European Union and NATO expansion. He might have gotten close but for the fact that his isolation and self-delusion resulted in his getting his own army wrong, Ukraine's army wrong, the NATO allies wrong, Joe Biden wrong, the Ukrainian people wrong, Sweden wrong, Finland wrong, Poland wrong, Germany wrong and the European Union wrong. In the process, he's made Russia into an energy colony of China and a beggar for Iran's drones. For someone who has been at the top of the Kremlin since 1999, that's a whole lot of wrong. Netanyahu and his coalition thought they could pull off a quick judicial coup, disguised as a legal reform, that would enable them to exploit the narrowest of election victories, roughly 30,000 votes out of some 4.7 million, to allow Netanyahu VE company to govern without having to worry about the only source of restraint on politicians in Israel's system, its independent judiciary and Supreme Court. Interestingly, at the first formal meeting of Netanyahu's cabinet, in December, he listed his government's four priorities, blocking Iran, restoring personal security for every Israeli, addressing the cost of living in the shortage of housing and widening the circle of peace with surrounding Arab states. He didn't mention appending the courts, apparently hoping to slip it past the public. Wrong. A vast majority of the Israeli public got it immediately and responded with the largest public backlash to any proposed legislation in the country's history. The opposition is now throughout Israeli society and beyond, Netanyahu got his army wrong, his technology startup community wrong, Joe Biden wrong and, polls show, most Israeli voters wrong. He got the base of his own party wrong, too, while there have been massive, broad-based protests every week against his judicial overhaul, there hasn't been a single large-scale grassroots demonstration in support. Netanyahu even got some of his most ardent conservative American Jewish supporters wrong. Miriam Adelson, writing in Israel Hayam, the right-wing Israeli newspaper founded by her billionaire late husband, Sheldon, decried the way in which the prime minister was trying to dash through such a significant change. It raises questions about the root objectives and concern that this is a hasty, injudicious and irresponsible move, she wrote, adding, bad motivations never bring about good outcomes. For someone serving as prime minister for the sixth time, that's a whole a lot of wrong. So, what comes next? You guessed it, both Netanyahu and Putin are blaming outside agitators and foreign funding for their problems. It's right out of the dictator's handbook. While Putin regularly blames the US and NATO for his military failures in Ukraine, the Times of Israel reported over the weekend that Netanyahu and his family have begun hinting that the State Department is the hidden hand funding the huge protests. The newspaper quoted a senior government official on Netanyahu's recent trip to Rome, sourcing usually used by the prime minister to hide his identity, as saying, there is an organized center from which all the demonstrators branch out in an orderly manner. Who finances the transportation, the flags, the stages? It's clear to us. The paper added, another member of the premier's entourage confirmed that the senior official was referring to the United States. How could two leaders get so many things wrong, despite having been in power for so many years? The question answers itself, they've been in power for so many years. Each man has built up enemies and trails of alleged corruption that leave them feeling its rule or die. In Netanyahu's case, that would mean figuratively dying, he's currently on trial on multiple corruption charges, and if convicted he could face jail time and an end to his life in politics. In Putin's case, it could mean literally dying, at the hands of his enemies. Netanyahu's rule or die fears led him to form a coalition with two ex-convicts and a rogues gallery of Jewish supremacists. 
Many were shunned by past prime ministers, indeed, previously by Netanyahu himself, but in his desperation he had to partner with them today because he had been abandoned by so many decent members of Likud. Putin, alas, is well beyond coalition building and sharing power. That was Putin 1.0 in the early 2000s. Putin 2.0, after 24 years in charge, knows that a leader like him, who has stolen as much money as he has, could never trust any successor to let him peacefully retire to his reported $1 billion mansion on the Black Sea. His official salary is $140,000 a year. He knows that to live or to at least live freely, he must remain president for life. So, Putin's two greatest innovations have been poison underwear and poison-tipped umbrellas to dispense with perceived enemies. What's most interesting to me is how Netanyahu and Putin each misread his own military. Putin has had to increasingly rely on convicts and mercenaries to carry the brunt of his war in Ukraine, while tens of thousands of Russian men have fled abroad to escape his draft. In Israel, Air Force pilots, army doctors and cyber warriors have all warned that the Israel Defense Forces are not going to just salute an Israeli dictator. Those speaking out include three retired senior officers, led by Joab Rosenberg, a former deputy head analyst for IDF intelligence, who flew to Washington this week to try to enlist American help in stopping Netanyahu's slow-motion coup. As Moshe Yelan, a former Netanyahu defense minister and a former army chief of staff, recently told a rally in Tel Aviv, according to my personal experience as a soldier and commander, if, God forbid, Israel will become a dictatorship, we will not have enough soldiers who will be ready to sacrifice their lives to defend the country, and it will cause an existential threat to the state of Israel. We just have to watch the poor performance of Putin's armed forces, lacking the spirit and lacking the confidence in their dictator in his path, to see what dictatorship does to an army. Putin and Netanyahu show why bad things happen to bad leaders. It is shocking to me how much Vladimir Putin and Benjamin Netanyahu have in common these days, both see themselves as great strategic chess players in a world where, they think, everyone else knows only how to play checkers. And yet both completely misread the world in which they were operating. In fact, they misread it so badly that it looks as if each is not playing chess or checkers, 